Welcome, everyone. We're grateful you can be here with us this morning as we study God's Word. We've had good turnouts, and after the program has gone off the air, many people have gone back and watched the recording. So we hope these things help us better as sermons ought to, and God expects them to, or any study of God's Word should, to face the affairs of this present world. So we thank you for being with us. And we will now pose this question for our consideration in the sermon this morning. Why do people blame God for their troubles? Why do people blame God for their troubles? It may be unknown to a great many people. World War I ended over 100 years ago. But we cannot begin to imagine, as it was called for many years until World War II, the Great War, how many multiplied millions died in Europe, and it had never been such a catastrophe before that time. And yet a great many religious people in France and in England in particular and others began to form in their minds, well, why would God have ever allowed this kind of thing to happen? So many millions of people would die. So some even mark World War I with the decline of belief in God and uh, the Bible and as far as what they would consider to be Christians. And this, of course, goes back to the idea of why do people blame God for their troubles? Well, when people suffer, because of wrong things that they've done or for things they omitted that they ought to have done. When I say ought to have done, presupposes an objective standard beyond them that is meant to guide their lives and all others. When they do this, in many cases, rather than admit their guilt, that it's their fault, it's because of poor choices they made, they look to someone or something besides themselves to place the blame for the consequences of their own bad choices. That's been the way it's been for out throughout history, we can say. Pe people just simply don't like to take responsibility for the wrong in their own lives. They don't like to say, this is coming upon me because I ought to have done this and I didn't, or I did this and I should not have. It is my fault. You see that in moral matters, people trying to justify themselves and all kind of moral sins. You see it in religious matters. People have believed for 500 years that salvation is by faith only, and they're simply not going to be told otherwise. Now, they may not immediately in their lives, because they may lead good moral lives, feel any impact here, but they are still lost in sin in the sight of God because they're not doing what he told them to do, and the way he told them to do it, and for the reason. So many people find it very convenient to blame God for their problems, and that raises the question as to the reasons that they do so. People blame God because, and here's our first one, they don't know that there's someone else to blame. They don't know there's somebody else out there or someone else to blame. The word, capital S-A-T-A-N, a name. Satan literally means adversary. Therefore, he's always been man's adversary. So there's somebody else to blame. In fact, he is the one to blame for all of the miseries of man. More to say about that in a moment. Of Satan, our Lord said this in John chapter 8, verse 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and standeth not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, 
He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. So it's our obligation because we're made as free moral agents. We have the power to choose whatever it is. We have the power to look at the evidence for the existence of God. We have the power to be honest with that evidence and where it leads us. We have the power to study the Bible and determine whether it is the all-sufficient, inspired, the final will of heaven to mankind, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Oh, we can reject it. We have the power to reject Jesus as the Savior of the world. We can accept it. We can know the evidence reasoned with correctly proves that Christ is deity. But because we don't like it and what it means in our lives, God's given us the power to reject it. So if we're going to do anything in this life, then we must resist he who's the father of lies. Because Peter tells us he's always, every day, all day long, on the prowl. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, concerning the second coming of Christ, he makes it clear that we're to be sober and watchful. For your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, who resists steadfast in your faith, knowing that the same sufferings are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. Now, in First and Second Peter, he's making it very clear you live each day as if the Lord's coming back now. He'll deal more specifically, as we shall later, concerning the design of time itself and why time continues. But what does this say about Satan? It's not God who's our adversary, but Satan is. Whose responsibility is it to resist him? It's our responsibility to resist him. How do we resist him? To love God with all that we have and are, to love God's truth and the application of it to our lives, regardless of the sacrifices we must make, to love our neighbors ourselves, and to be busy in the kingdom, according to Matthew 6, verse 33. So Satan is ultimately responsible for all evil that is in the world and not God. Yet in times of even this COVID virus business, why did God allow this to happen? And then it's kind of interesting when men have come up with certain ways to protect people from possibly getting infected. You see all this business say, well, the government's not going to tell me to do this and I'm a free American and they're infringing on my rights. So I'll go ahead and act this way and, of course, it may mean I give somebody else that disease, but by all means, I'll do as I please. And then we wonder what happens to us. It's no wonder some of us are in the mess we're in. There's another reason that people blame God. And we said this earlier. People don't want to be responsible for the creation of their own problems. We think of moral matters and we think of abortion. We think of fornication. We think of divorce. We think of you know, euthanasia. We think of murder. We think of lies. We think of covetousness and jealousy and envy. We think of theft and all the religious sins where people know the Bible says this, but they're going to have it their way. Remember the Pharisees and Sadducees? But they all have one single solitary thing in common. They are ways in which people try to escape the responsibility they have for their own given situations, for their own actions. The truth is that we are each responsible for the quality of his own life. And sometimes just the circumstances we have. That's true, evil's in the world, and no matter how good we are as we strive to obey the truth, we can be influenced by wicked people about us. But the point is, we need to understand the design and purpose of life and the flesh on this earth in the first place. I've said it many times, not original with me, but this life is perfect for what God made it to be, and that is to prove to God we love him, 
The only way to do that is keep his commandments. So that's the whole duty of man. And how do I prove my faith, my confidence, my trust, my belief in him and his system of salvation, the gospel system? Well, by an obedient faith. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's clear. Hebrews 5, 9. But look at the people out there saying that they are offering you salvation through Christ, but they teach you don't have to obey him. Well, whose fault is it on the day of judgment when they hear, depart from me, you that work iniquity? Well, it's certainly going to be the people who knew the Bible but didn't obey it or could have known the Bible and wouldn't or could have lived their lives here faithful to him, let come what may, but they would not, or they sought to justify themselves in their own eyes. In other words, they sought to blame somebody else for the mess they're in, or else just simply deny that there is somebody else to blame. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, be not deceived. Now, that's my responsibility and yours. To be deceived is to believe a lie. And so, what is my responsibility? He wrote this to Christians, you know. Be not deceived. Well, there's a reason for that. You can't fool God. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his own flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth unto the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's not hard to understand. I would hate to know that I said I'm too dumb to understand those words. And nobody else in my family is smart enough to understand it. But really, that's not the problem. The problem is we know those words too often, but we're living contrary to them, and that we're doing because we choose to do it, and we don't admit we're wrong. Or if something comes upon us, our faith has grown so weak, or it's just completely gone, it can't be my problem. It must be somebody else's. So we follow the example of Cain and kill the righteous brother. We can take responsibility for our own problems brought about by our bad decisions and recognize that we often get ourselves into hurtful situations, not only hurtful to us, but hurtful to others, or we can deny it and blame it on God. But there are others who simply look at God as an easy target. Have you noticed that when we find ourselves in difficulties because of our own choices, then in many cases, we want to blame those who are in charge. Now think about that for a minute. Think about the job, all the jokes told on bosses, the attitude people have toward government, and so on and so forth. While you even have in the church the attitudes of so-called fine, upstanding Christians toward elders, no matter how well qualified they are and how well they do the job, because many people just don't want to admit elders have authority. Well, you can admit it or you can deny it, and you can array yourself against it. Authority. It's all going to rise up to bite you someday, and if you let it go to the day of judgment, you'll be bitten eternally. God is in charge of everything. So we reason, ultimately, he's to blame. Further, God will not argue with us. The only reasoning he does with us is in his infallible word. If you say, well, God, what would you have me to do to be saved? He's not going to speak directly from heaven today in an audible voice and tell you. It's like one of these posts I've seen as a cartoon on Facebook. And somebody's looking up to heaven wanting to know what God would have him to do, and there comes a hand back down from heaven with a Bible in it. Well, that's exactly what Paul told Timothy. All scriptures give him inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That means spiritually complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, Again, you can't get plainer than that, but why won't people believe what they read when they claim it's from God, it's the will of God, it's to guide man. So God won't argue with us. He says, come let us reason together while there's time to do that. But he's not going on the day of judgment to argue with you. Have you ever noticed that every one of the depictions of the judgment that Jesus gave, when people begin to bring up all these excuses as to why they didn't obey God, there's no 
answer in the form of an argument as to why you should have done that. They're just the answer of depart from me. They receive the sentence and that's it. The time for determining what's right and wrong and rejecting the wrong and doing the right is now. And that's set out in the infallible word of God. Those who desire to blame God for their problems have forgotten a big thing about time. And that is what I mentioned earlier about Peter's writings. Time goes on because God is long suffering to us. He doesn't want anyone to be lost in the devil's hell. He doesn't want anyone to perish. Now remember, Peter wrote what I'm about to read to members of the church, to Christians. And in 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12, here's what he said. And to students of the Bible, it's just as common as it can be. This again ties into the idea that time goes on to allow people to change for the good. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, that is his second coming, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But then notice what he says, but the day of the Lord will come. Then he adds on to it, that which tells us how he's going to come, as a thief. You don't know when he's going to come. In which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. They'll be dissolved. I don't know what kind of heat that is, but it's something the world's never seen, and it'll be brought directly about by God. Nothing in this world going to pot is going to cause the world to end. God will deliberately bring the world to an end in this way when he gets ready. Notice he says, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Then he says, now here's the way you Christians ought to let this affect you. Seeing that these things are thus to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness, looking for and hasting or earnestly desiring the coming of the day of God? A question, members of the church, Christians, do we honestly desire the coming of the day of God? Because that's when he says, by the which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements melt with fervent heat. But for the faithful child of God who has endured steadfastly in the faith, it's the end of all probation and all trial. And it's the opening of the door to eternal glory. God has a reason that things are like they are. And in his word, he tells us enough so that we'll understand those particular reasons. Luke tells us, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that the apostle Paul preached in Athens, in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. In the times of this ignorance, what they were doing then, that he confronts as he preaches the gospel to them, God winked at or overlooked. But what about in the Christian age? But now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Uh, you couldn't do that if you weren't a free moral agent. And that if you weren't responsible for getting yourself into the mess you're in, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. And sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3.4. Now who chose to transgress the law? Well, it. Certainly wasn't God. He didn't put us here and say, I'm going to give you a law and make you transgress it. He made us free moral agents. We choose to violate God's law. So we see then that we have the opportunity in this life to prove God to God that we love him. Now, one of those things is, is that when I have sinned and I chose to sin, because it gratified uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, then I've got to admit I did it. It was my fault. In fact, I enjoyed it. That's why I chose it in the first place. The pleasure is a sin for a season, and I acknowledge I've done it. Look at all the examples of the Old Testament where godly men sinned and then repented. That was written before time for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the Old Testament scriptures in this case, 
about to have a hope, Romans 15, 4. So we want to be sure that we realize God has given assurance that he is sending his son back because he's raised him from the dead. That's the way that uh, Paul argued. Notice he said plainly, inasmuch as he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Do you know for sure that Christ was raised from the dead? Well, all the evidence says he was. Well, if you do believe that, then won't you believe the same scriptures that tells you Christ is coming back at the end of the world and what's going to happen to all material things and the judgment to come? It's our responsibility and nobody else's that we are what we are and how we receive or reject the gospel and why we do it. No use blaming God. There are some people, of course, in their religious doctrine that don't believe in man having free will, so they blame God for whatever happened to them. That's nothing more than pure Calvinism. They believe that God has determined everything that will happen. I think I've related this in times past in a debate on Calvinism that the faithful gospel preacher responding to the Calvinist who had an apple sitting there beside the lectern and declared that God had foreordained and predetermined everything and predetermined that he would eat that apple and nobody else would. And the gospel preacher reached up real quickly, got it, and began to eat on it. Well, that pretty well settles that for anybody that can think themselves out the way paper bag. God is responsible for making man a creature of choice. That's true. But he also gave us the ability to recognize truth from error, accept the truth, and reject the error. The truth is that men have the freedom to choose them between right and wrong, and God has given us the right. Whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed, John, uh, James 1.25. Listen to what was said of old by Moses to Israel, Deuteronomy 30. And verse 19, he said, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. For I have set before thee life and death and blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life that thou mayest live, thou and thy seed. And we're all familiar with Joshua's statement to Israel in Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. And then he made clear who he had chosen. But it's for me and my house will serve the Lord. He has no free will. If he didn't, these words mean nothing. Then we come to the New Testament. And Jesus' admonition to those of his day and us too, and that'll be true to the end of the world, in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in therein. It's the easy way. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. And one reason, among many, that people don't find it is because they're too bent upon having things done according to the appetites of the flesh and the way things work in this world, and they can't conceive anything ever being any different. In fact, they even make uh, God over into their own image. And so they see him as just a man that's a superman. Many problems arise, and I can't overly emphasize this, because we make bad choices. And then people blame God because they want God to fix their problems immediately. They're still trying to dictate to God, you see. They reason that since God has not solved their problems or fixed them immediately, then he must not want to. He doesn't love them. So they blame God. And some of this is because of a lack of understanding of the promise Jesus gave to the apostles. Now, mind you, he is speaking in this context to the apostles 
regarding their work as apostles of Christ, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, who would be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would have invisibly the same relationship with the apostles of Christ that Jesus had with them in the flesh, and that he would guide them into all truth, as well as cause them to infallibly remember everything he taught them. Now, look at John chapter 16 and verse 23. Then there are, of course, similar passages. But John 16, 23 reads, And in that day ye shall ask me no question. Verily, verily, truly, truly, it's a fact, it's a fact. I say unto you, if ye shall ask anything of the Father, he will give it you in my name. Well, that has to do with the revelation of the truth of Jesus Christ and the apostles acting in their official capacity. That's why the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. They knew that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, was guiding and leading the apostles to teach the will of heaven to them. They had it not written down, so they did what the apostles told them. In other words, you could say the New Testament was in the men, but today it's in a book. The apostles are teaching us today the same thing they taught in the first century as they walked this earth. They just do it through writings now. And so we still have the apostles' doctrine, and we're still expected to abide by it. But what am I talking about here? Let me reemphasize it. Many believe that God must immediately fix their problems. So you can see that this business of asking in his name by his authority. Don't forget that in his name means by his authority. They would be acting according to how Christ guided them and revealed them to them the will of heaven originally. First Corinthians 13 says that revelation of the New Testament came in part and parcel. So it didn't all come in one day and one book fell out of heaven and that was the New Testament as we have it. In the miraculous age of the church, God's wisdom, he chose to reveal in part and parcel what became the New Testament, the totality of it. So this had to do with the apostles and the revelation of truth. But these folks who used this fail to remember, if they ever knew, that God, to begin with, hasn't given us a blank check. Just pray anything you want, and God's obligated to give it because you're a Christian. Concerning unanswered prayers, James instructed the brethren of his day, and so all Christians, in James 4 and verse 3, ye ask, well, didn't he tell us to ask? Ye ask, and receive not. Well, there must be a reason. Because ye ask amiss. Well, what was the problem? that ye may spend it in your pleasures. Oh, Father, please help me to win this and to win that. Help me this. God, you're not going to get an answer to those prayers. That is simply saying, I want to have this money to spend on myself as it suits me and gratifying my own life here. God never promised to give us anything and everything that our heart desired. Never did. God never even promised to deliver us from all troublesome situations. You know, we never could develop some of the Christian character traits if we didn't have to face problems and endure them. No one likes them. But Jesus couldn't have given us salvation if he hadn't endured the cross and suffered. And he's actually told us each one of us has a cross to bear and that we must sacrifice in order to be faithful to him. Paul asked three times to have whatever that thorn was in his flesh to be removed but God wouldn't. God simply said his grace was sufficient for him, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. And then some people will say, well, I don't know why in the world God won't remove this from me, or I don't know why. Well, you know, God knows more than you do. God knows you better than you know yourself. The best way we can ever see ourselves, if we ever hope to, as God does, is to read your Bible and honestly reflect on your thinking in life in the light of what it says God expects man to do. But I'm glad we have a Heavenly Father who can withhold things from us because he knows we can't handle it. Remember Peter, O oh Lord, though they all forsake you, I won't. In a matter of hours, he denied the Lord. You see, he just thought he was strong and that he could handle it, but he couldn't. 
So when God says no to some of our requests, even when we think they're for our spiritual well-being, God may know better. That means we simply have the attitude that God does know better and that we order our lives accordingly. Notice, we order our lives. We make the decision, and we order our lives to do his will. But now others may say, well, since God created everything, he's responsible for everything, including bad things that happen. Well, that sort of ties into the other one, but um, that's just not the case. It's true, God did create everything that's in existence, Genesis 1, verse 1. But someone else, now mind you this, someone else entered in and modified some of those things for evil purposes, purposes contrary to God's will. And guess who that was? Well, we told you about him in the beginning of the lesson. The devil, old Satan himself. Genesis 1, verses 1 through 25, tells us plainly, that everything that God created was good as he created it. Well, every man was created good and sinless. But man sins. Adam and Eve were created good, but they were free moral agents. Thus they chose to sin. And when we sin, listen, we ruin what God creates. And thus this whole world is sin cursed today. God is responsible for all good that is in the world. James 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But men can pervert that. People take the Bible. They misuse it and abuse it. What did the early church in Corinth do to the Lord's Supper? Lord's Supper is a good thing. But they corrupted it and turned it into something because they're free moral agents and had the power and choice to do it that was condemned, and Paul corrected them on that. So we end up doing the same thing a lot of times. A lot of the things that are in the world are in a mess they're in because of men messing around with things. It's... When you think of sickness, and you think of germs, and you think of viruses, that wasn't the way God created things. How did they come into existence? Some way or the other, down through the stream of time, man's done something that loused it all up. When man got cut off because of his sin from eating of the tree of life, which was meant to keep a physical body going on, then all sorts of things began to happen, and none of it was good. And so we see the origin of all kinds of diseases. So he's not responsible for evil. He's responsible for good. The devil's responsible for evil. And men are responsible for following the devil and bringing this evil on them. Man is responsible for his own behavior. What did we say in the beginning? Nobody wants to admit that. Romans 2, 6 through 11. Romans 2, 6 through 11. Paul wrote, who will render to every man according to his works. To them that by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and incorruption, eternal life. But unto them that are factious and obey not the truth, but obey unrighteousness, shall be wrath and indignation, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that worketh evil of the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there's no respect of persons with God. Did you notice that he zeroes in on the factious person and this letter is written to Christians? He didn't zero in on the adulterer or the thief or the murderer or the homosexual. He talked about factious people. Factious people operate this way. I want it this way and I'm going to have it this way and I'm going to tear up everything there is to get it my way. Think there are any of those in the church? Well, if you don't believe there is, you're in need of this lesson. No doubt whatsoever, because it comes from somewhere, and it doesn't come from God. For Ananias and Sapphira are responsible for their actions. Did they choose to lie? Well, certainly they did. Well, how do we know how God thinks of them? Well, just read the text. You'll see how God thinks of them. 
And while he doesn't take care of people immediately today as he took care of those two liars, on the day of judgment, he will. People assume that bad things don't happen for a good purpose. That's another reason they, they blame God for things. As I said off and on throughout this lesson, God's prepared a place in this physical world and the way he made man in a fleshly body to give us an opportunity to say, I choose God rather than to live as if this life is all there is to it. And I'm willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. I'm willing to undergo privation that I can be faithful. I'm willing to sacrifice my time, my talents, my money, and all that I am. Because you see, the first commandment is to love God with all you are and all you have, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And certainly we're commanded to love the brethren. But we don't love the brethren. We don't try to get them to live like the Bible says Christians are to live. So who do we blame? Well, the church is in the mess because it's God's fault. Well, God cares for the church. His own son purchased the church with his blood, and he so loved the world that he gave his son. Well, then, where are problems coming from in the church? They're coming from Satan and those in the church who choose to violate God's will rather than obey it. One place it can come from. It certainly doesn't come from God. In fact, sometimes when bad things happen to us, we automatically consider it punishment. But the fact of the matter is that not all bad things then are inherently bad. How easy is this for us to see? It's not hard. If you consider certain medical procedures to correct problems of the body or to eliminate disease in the body, or you have a situation like we're undergoing now where we're having to undergo all sorts of privations from normal active life of say five months ago, but we do it, or some of us do. Some of us ignore some of these things, and then we go out and get sick, and, well, my, 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 didn't God love me, and am I not one of his children, and why wouldn't he preserve me because of my faith in him? Well, you made poor choices. You got out and associated yourself with folks and called a disease that if you had minded your own business and cared for yourself and loved God and kept his commandments, you would have been particular. No, no, nobody's going to infringe upon my rights. I'll do it. God will take care of me. I can jump in the fire, and I won't get burned. Didn't he do that for the three Hebrew children? Well, yes, but that was for them, and written a four time for our learning, that God can take care of us. But you remember their attitude? They said, God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to the idol. They knew the law of Moses. They knew God had given his will to them as Israelites under the law of Moses. So God can providentially today, not working a miracle, take care of all of us, but he expects us to make right choices, sensible choices, common sense choices, choices that show we care for ourselves as well as our families and our neighbors. So when you got a situation like the COVID-19 virus, it's a good time to think about these things. You can get uh, a disease from somebody else who didn't pay attention to try to keep themselves away. But when you ignore matters that are good for you, then don't blame God when you get yourself in a mess. But I am thankful that we have medical procedures, some of them very painful and drawn out but they can eliminate some of our problems. So they're not all there because for us to be punished by. The athlete who counted, loves his athletics, still must put him through himself through tremendous physical stress to improve his performance. Why in the world can't we realize that about living the Christian life? And God has made a perfect place for us to demonstrate how much we want to serve him, how much we love him, how much we fa have faith we have in the gospel system. Blessed are you when men shall reproach you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 said, and he hath said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Wherefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in injuries, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Whatever can happen to me to make me not trust in myself, but to put more trust in God and his word and cause me to walk closer to him, then let it happen. We don't necessarily like to think that way, but that's the way it works. People forget to praise God, so they blame God for things. They forget that he is the father of goodness. They criticize him. They think of him as a man. God is never worthy of criticism. He's only worthy of praise. If you go back to the Old Testament, you can see some wonderful descriptions of praise. In Psalm 18.3, the psalmist said, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And then at the end of the Bible, in chapter 4 of Revelation, we find thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So what have we seen today? This, in effect, has been a study somewhat of the problem of evil, and no evil comes from God. It comes from Satan, and God only has good. We can choose to serve the good, God, or we can choose to sin against him and serve Satan. And we must come to the grips with the fact that much of the evil in my life is because I made bad choices, and I have to acknowledge that. People blame God because they don't know there's someone else to blame. They don't want to take responsibility for creating their own problems. God's an easy target. Some people don't believe in free will, so God's responsible. Many believe that God must immediately fix their problems. And since God created everything, he's responsible for everything, even the evil. And people assume that bad things don't happen for good purposes. And then they forget to praise God for who he is. And then they forget the long suffering of God with us in a world fitted so that we can choose to show God our love for him and our faith in him and his system of salvation. Because we look beyond this life and we look beyond the flesh and material things and we see glory that is so unlike where we live now. Let's not lose sight of that. For part of what saves us is our expectation of heaven for which faithful children of God have a right to expect. And let us build up the earnest desire to receive it by being faithful to him in all things, giving him honor and glory. Now, there may be someone that would like to obey the gospel to become a Christian. There is a plan of salvation. It's clear and plain. Many reject it, but it's still the plan of salvation. God's plan of salvation. You must believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. As a child of God, as we say many times, if you blame God or felt like it for things you did that brought wrong on you or bad on you, repent of that. Repent of any other sin you've committed since you've become a Christian. Repent of them, confess them, we pray God for forgiveness. We thank you for being with us today. We hope this has made all of us better and looking to God for guidance and not blaming him for things that are our own fault because the devil's in the world and we've listened to him. So we invite you next time to be with us and we hope that you'll have a good rest of the day. Thank you.